Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. Pretty excited to keep this talk, and I don't know where you are in the world, but it's just one of the positive things we get to do with the global situation. So I hope you like the talk and yeah, just enjoy and do not hesitate to write your questions in the chat box. So I'm gonna tell you what we know so far about small eye stingrays in Mozambique. So they are theoretically the largest marine woodtail stingrays in the world. Nothing less than that. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, really quickly. So my name is Atlantine bourgeois basqua I am a French student in marine biology and ecology in as part of a master's, but also part of an engineering school. And I'm in my final year right now. So during my studies about two years ago, I had the opportunity, the very great opportunity to be an intern for MMF. And so I was uh, based in Tofu for six months and my focus project was to um, organize and analyze all the data the organization had been collecting for years about these species. So here's the result of this research. So just a little bit of background on small eye stingrays. So the scientific name or Latin name is Megatrigon microbes. So it means mega for uh, big, trigon for stingray, and microbes for having small eyes. So gives you a good basic description of the species, a big stingray with very, very tiny eyes. Um, they are uh, brownish on the top with very cool spots, white spots on the dorsal face. So a really charismatic species. Um, you will learn why. Uh, in a, in a minute during the presentation. They are part of the um, Miliobatiforms order, which includes all stingrays and relatives. And more specifically, they belong to the um, Dasiatidae family. So it only includes whiptail stingrays, like the very common um, stingray that we can find, for example, in the Mediterranean Sea for uh, the people who know, who know them. Um, and that's it for the taxonomy. So just a quick fun fact about the first description. Um, it was in 1908 by a zoo, um, Scottish zoologist called Nelson Anendel, Anendel. And it was from a specimen caught by a trawler of the Indian coast. And it was caught, I think, at 30 meters deep, so not, not too deep. But the thing is that the individual was white and I just told you they are brown with white spots so white is weird color and at that time and then they thought that it was a deep sea species because of the pale color the small eyes and the delicate skin so it was really not uh, looking as the one we know today so we don't have any official explanation um, one that came out with that it was um, an albino uh, individual, but that would be really extraordinary to just find a random albino specimen for the first time. So the most plausible explanation is that this particular individual was maintained immersed in the water for a long time after its death, so that the brown pigments of the skin were just washed out and it looked white in the end. And if you look at a freshly caught small eye stingray, so that looks like that. It is brown, and you can see, you can still see the white spots. So, anyhow, I just found it really funny that the very first description was based on a weirdly colored small eye stingray. Um, so, the main fact about small eye stingrays is that, okay, they're really large, but they are so rare. The literature about them is just very limited might be 15 to 20 papers top, and almost all of them until a couple of years ago, or last year maybe, uh, probably, it was all papers um, for randomly caught specimen around the world, just saying, hey, we found a small eye stingray, and it hadn't been seen here before. And that's all. So that's not a lot of information, but it extended the known range of the species, so that was still, it was still useful. But in 2008, Simon Pierce and Andrew Marshall, who founded the Marine Megafauna Foundation, so well shark researcher and mentor researcher, um, they published about live free swimming individuals they had seen during the dive during their research 
in Mozambique um, in Tofu. So that was really the first time officially that we were seeing them in the natural environs. And it also extended the range of the species because it was the last location on the east, on the west side, sorry, of their range was the Maldives. So it was a 5,000 kilometers extension um, of their range. But it was, yeah, it was a big, big step so that we were from now on able to see them um, in the environment and to learn more about them. Um, this, you can see they have a wide yet patchy distribution all across the Indo-West Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can see where in which locations they have been recorded so far. So the red dots are the um, locations where randomly Ran, yeah, they were randomly caught by um, fishermen, so either in trawlers or long lines or sea nets, and it, it, had, it has been published. So it's official records of a small ice stingrays. So in the Persian Gulf, in um, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, the Gulf of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and North Australia too. And the gray and white spots are um, small ice stingrays that were seen free swimming in the ocean by recreational divers or researchers. So the um, gray spots are actually from pictures or videos that I found online on social media. So one in Sotwana Bay, South Africa. There was one, one time in the Philippines and there's a couple of sightings or may maybe a little bit more, maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 sightings on, um, of Queensland in Australia. So I think there's a, a wreck there, the Yongala wreck. So apparently it's a good spot to see them. But the best spot to uh, my knowledge is really Tofu in Mozambique where we can see up to maybe 30 individuals per year. So if you want to have the bench, best chance to see one, uh, one day just, just come to Tofu for sure. Um, so just a little bit now about the anatomy. So starting with the just the main appearance, they are so brown with the white spots on the dorsal face, but on the underside they are white. Um, like any stingray, they have the eyes on the top uh, next to the spiracles. So the spiracles are kind of the small pumps that allow them to breathe and to pump the water through the gills. So basically the water comes in through the spiracles and goes through um, the gill slits on the underside. So you see the five pairs of gill slits on the underside. And that's also this feature that allows them to stay motionless on the seafloor. Um, so they're not moving and they're still able to breathe. On the contrary to manta rays, for example, when they're adults, they can they have to swim all the time. It's called ram ventilation, and they have to swim all the time with the mouth open, so the water goes through the mouth and through the gills, and that's the only way they can breathe. So they are a little bit lucky on this part. Um, then they do have a stinger based on in um, so it's located in the mid area of the tail, and it does secrete uh, venom. Um, what else do you have? Uh, the size, yeah, the size. So the official record maximum size recorded so far is 2.2 meters wide. So that's what we call disc width. So from wingtip to wingtip. And the total length, so from the head to the end of the tail was 3.2 uh, meters. So that's big, but you might say that's not the biggest whiptail stingray recorded. Um, ever and you're true, you're right because the, I think the record is from a um, freshwater stingray that was 2.4 meters wide. But it's our um, knowledge and um, not mine personally, but Andrew Marshall. She's so used to estimate the size of mandarin that can grow up to five, six meters wide that when she see uh, she sees a small ice stingray, she's able to estimate the size roughly and she's sure that uh, small ice stingrays can grow bigger than that. She would get something like three meters wide or even a little bit more. So that would make them the actually uh, the, the largest whiptail stingray in the world. So very, very impressive to see underwater. 
and and they have this very particular shape um so the um, disc width the disc um pectoral disc so you see the pectoral fins are kind of merged with the head and this diamond shape is very distinctive um among stingrays most other stingrays have a round shape and we'll see a little bit later in the talk it has to do with them um, probably has to do with the way they swim and yeah, the kind of information we also record we also pay attention to is the sex of the animal when we see one so you'll have to look at the pelvic fin area and if you see these tiny calcified organs that means it's a male and if they don't have any uh, like this one it's a female so it's the same thing for all sharks and rays okay now we know very little about their habitat preference and use uh, in Mozambique we often see them we almost always see them on the same reefs that we do we see manta rays so especially reefs that have cleaning stations so for those of you who don't know what a cleaning station is it's an area on a reef uh, not necessarily with corals it can in Mozambique we don't have a lot of corals in Tofu we it's mostly rocky rocky reefs but it's kind of clusters of small fish and when a big animal like a big ray a big shark a turtle or even a big woofer uh, comes to this cluster of fish it kind of hoovers and stays stable um, at, in this area and the small fish come to clean um, the big animal so it can it is really useful for all the marine megafauna species um, mentories have been shown to spend up to eight hours a day on the cleaning station so that shows how important it can be for them uh, just for like hygiene maybe get rid of the parasites bacteria and it also it's probable that it also allows them to recover quickly from um, wounds uh, for example shark bites or any kind of wounds uh, that helps them um, heal quickly so for habitats we see them on cleaning station we see them swimming but we don't know what kind of other habitat they might be using elsewhere um about the locomotion so i told you about the very particular shape diamond shape they have it's very uncommon um among stingrays among whiptail stingrays i should say um they don't swim like the other stingrays that kind of undulate the margins of the pectoral fins but rather they flap the pectoral fins up and down like manta rays or like eagle rays so if they are not with the sting rays that are they are part of the of another family so that's really uncommon and it might be a case of convergent evolution and that makes them um able to swim uh i think quicker than other species and then makes them really strong swimmers uh, especially with the very strong currents we have in Mozambique it's pretty impressive to see them swim um, and and yeah it's really really graceful to see in the water so I'm gonna show you a little a short footage of a small icing ray swimming um, yeah so you can pay attention also I, I like this picture because you can see how tiny the eyes are and how big are the spiracles next to it so uh during the video you can pay attention to the spiracles you can see it's opening up and closing um as the smallest stingray is breathing so it's very short i hope it works and here it goes okay um now about the feeding so again i'm sorry this is something you will hear during all the talk there's so many things we still need to learn about them so i'm giving you what we know so feeding we don't really know what they feed on there was one um male's stomach content that was ever examined um and it can it yeah they found the remains of this kind of fish so it's a very common benthic uh, carnivorous fish in the Indian and West Pacific Ocean. So our best guess is that they probably feed on that kind of small fish on the seafloor and crustacean and mollusks. But that's our best guess. Because in Mozambique we never, never, never see them 
feeding. We see them swimming, cruising by, getting clean, but that's it. So we don't know why. Maybe it's not the areas where they feed or maybe they feed mostly at night, but it's just a big mystery. However, there is actually one awesome footage, um, and to my, to my knowledge, it's the only footage of a foraging small stingray we have so far. It's from a BBC documentary crew. Um, they were in, a south, in the south of Mozambique in the natural reserve of Ponta Dua, and they were filming dolphins with um, drones that had different shapes. There was a squid drone, there was a um, nautilus drone, and a total drone, and they just found a small eye stingray, and it's just mind blowing. So I'm just going to show you the video. There are comments in it, uh, so um, I hope the sound is high enough and you can understand it. And otherwise, I will just explain it again uh, at the end if you have questions about it. Okay, I hope you get most of it. So that is just an incredible footage of a foraging small eye stingray, and we've just never witnessed something like that before. So it was really, really big, but it's not very spread in the scientific community. So I just randomly found this in a documentary, uh, in the BBC documentary. I think it's um, uh, Spy in the Pod. Uh, that's the name of the documentary, if you want to watch it. And, and yeah, so it's just amazing. So they do feed on the seafloor like other stingrays, and apparently they attract many other species. So I'll come back to that later for the other stingrays. But cobias that are known scavengers, just follow them because they know the smallest stingray is going to find the, the right feeding grounds and that everyone is going to be able to find something to eat. So that's just really cool to watch. And it's sad that we, we don't see that <laughs> often in, in Topo. We just see them swimming, which is already pretty cool. But we would learn so much more if we, if we were seeing them feeding. Anyhow, so about their reproduction uh, we can guess a pregnancy uh, in a female when we observe that the, the abdomen is really distended so it's the same way we guess pregnancies uh, with manta rays so Andrew Marshall she's really used to it um, and she was she took this picture so you, you can see here the abdomen is really massively distended and we haven't recorded so many females, pregnant females so far. I think the number is four or something, which is pretty, pretty small, but we haven't recorded many, many small stingrays either. So, so far, four pregnant females. We don't know much about their reduction, except that they are a placental uterus. So like any stingray, that their live youngs that are sustained on a yolk sac, and then later during the pregnancy, then uh, feed on what we call histotroph. So it's kind of a uterine milk that is secreted by the mother. And we don't know how long it lasts, the gestation period, but then the mother would just release the youngs when they're ready to, to be released. And there would be no parental care or anything like that if it's like any other um, race, uh, stingray species. So that's what uh, uh, the fetus looked like. It was just one pregnant female that was ever examined by scientists. Um, I think it was in 1976. Uh, this, this is from a paper and it was, the female contained only one um, late term fetus that was about 33 centimeters this width and 50 centimeters total length. And it looked exactly like an adult small eye stingray, right? so it was probably about to be released by the mother. So leaders are probably small, as small as one pup, but who knows? There might be uh, leaders in the stingray species can vary to from a number to a larger number, so it can be one to three or one to four in other species. So for this one, we know it can be as little as one, but we don't know if it can be more. Uh, youngs at the same time. Uh, we don't know how how long they take to reproduce, how old they are uh, to when they reach sexual maturity or just how long they can live for. Um, if we had to provide like a rough estimate, we would do it from other stingray species, so other large related uh, stingray species, and that would be something like 15, 20 years old. 
but aging methods in raising sharks are still being discussed, so I would not relate too much on it um, for now, at least. Um, so yeah, this one was, um, this picture was taken by Andrea, just a little bit up north on the coast uh, from Dofo. She's based there now, and um, station, MMF station is still based in Dofo a little bit um, south on the coast. I'll show you a map later. Uh, so is the smallest stingray a threatened species? Um, so the fact is that usually fishermen don't target them. Most people don't even know they exist. And that would be very ambitious to target them because they're so rare. But it does happen, bycatch does happen um, with trawlers and long lines and sea nets. So that's how we uh, know about the range of the species rights. Remember with the distribution map, some specimens have been caught uh, in fisheries. It occasionally happens that they are specifically targeted uh, by spear fishermen. So that was the case for this one in Vilanculos, so where Andrew is based in Mozambique. Uh, in 2013, a spear fisherman um, just caught one small icing ray, but that doesn't happen really often, obviously. But it does happen. So right now, we don't know enough. We don't have enough information to assess, to evaluate the conservation status of the species. That's why the species is classified as data deficient by the IUCN in the red list. And that's a big problem. And that's the case for many, many other ray and shark species today. Many of them are in the endangered, we know it, but the other, there are still many, many species where we lack information to determine if they are endangered or not. And from what we could guess about the small ice stingray, we would take information from uh, their relative, the relatives of the small ice stingray. They are likely to have life history characteristics that make, make them more vulnerable to such threats. So if they are slow to reproduce, they have few youngs, they reach sexual maturity at a late stage in their life, in the lifespan, they, are, they have a long lifespan. That's all these characteristics characteristics make them more vulnerable to um, fisheries. So we, that's really something for me that is crucial. Uh, it is crucial to fill in the gaps and to, more, to know more about the species so that if they are at risk, we have to know it as soon as possible so we can implement appropriate strategies to better protect them. Uh, otherwise, if we just wait, uh, it might be too late when we find out. Um, so that's the Marine Megafauna Foundation is doing, trying to really base uh, big decisions on science and research. So they just try to study as much as possible this potentially threatened species to make sure that the um, the appropriate decisions are made afterwards to better protect them. So um, MMF has been collecting data on small ice stingray since the very beginning. So even before MMF was created, Andrew Marshall and Simon Pierce were already in Mozambique. So I think the first sighting must date back to um, 2005. And they just started recording um, everything they could on uh, the small ice stingrays in Mozambique. So here's a sum up of what we know about them there, uh, what we've uh, what I've come to deduce with the all the analysis of the data we had. So last year we published the first world dedicated study on small ice stingrays, mostly focusing on the use of photo ID methodology on the species. So for those of you who don't know what photo ID is. It's a very useful tool for biologists and ecologists, not only in the marine field, but also terrestrial field, that uses the natural pattern on the body of the animal to identify um, in individuals. So it's like a fingerprint that you would use for humans, but you use it on animals, and you are able to recognize an individual, to distinguish an individual from another and to follow, monitor these individuals over the lifespan. So in order to do that, you need to have a pattern that is um, stable enough so you can, the animals keep the same 
all along the lifespan and unique enough so you're able to say okay this individual is definitely different than this one so that's what we did with the white spots of the small eye stingrays it hadn't been done before but we know it works for manta rays for whale sharks and for other species like turtles it's really really useful so we tried to do that we just assemble all the photos and footages we had in, into a big catalog and every time we had a new picture we just compared the new picture to the whole catalog and see if we get a match if we recognize the individual and we did that for already all the pictures we, we had collected and the cool fact about about the study is that we had data collected from three different locations so if you look at this map um, 95 percent of our data comes from tofu tofu beach vera area but also we had data from andrea uh, based in binoculos and working in the bizarro archipelago national park so it's 200 kilometers north of tofu and also from zabra where there is another very very cool um research institutes um and there also we are in partnership with them they also um send us their sightings information when they have so we were able to identify so when we wrote the paper we have identified 70 different individuals and among these 70 individuals 15 of them had been sighted more than once so that's what we call a reciting if we have an individual and we were able to match one picture with another picture and another another time so another year or later during the year or any anyhow so it was really really cool just to be able to count them so just to have the first estimation of the population size uh, in Mozambique for small eye stingrays and the sightings the re-sightings are really interesting to know how they move along the coast so that's the next slide um, so that was in January last year and by January 2020 we had increased this number um, up to 81 individuals, including 20 recitings. So that's pretty, pretty exciting to know that with effort and pictures were coming from researchers, but also recreational divers. So people who had just seen small ice stingray on the dive were kind enough to take the pictures and help us uh, have as many pictures in our catalog as possible. So a big thing about Recitings is the longest time we had uh, between two sightings of the same individual um, and this time period was seven years and that's really recent because uh, so this this was a female that was first seen uh, in 2012 uh, Giant's Castle is a very um, very classic uh, dive site in Tofu it's right in front of the beach so that's the one where we go very very often and the same ray was spotted so two years later at the same dive site so you can compare do it yourself with the spot comparison so it's really the same individual and it was seen again in 2018 rob's bottom is another dive site a little south on the coast but like a few kilometers south and then the last sighting was last year um, in August at the same dive site, so Giant's Castle. So that's seven years apart, the same individual. So, hey, we know they live at least seven years. And this one was already adult when we saw, saw her first. So that's, that's very, very exciting to be able to follow them and know that they come back to the same area uh, just all the, along the years that's pretty pretty exciting so here's a map of all the recitings so you have the numbers the identification numbers of uh, each small ice stingray that has been cited more than once so, so for example the number 14 in red here has been spotted at this dive site here uh, twice in 2012 and then it has been sighted again two years later here at this dive site, which is pretty nearby. And then three years later, so five years later than the first sighting south on the coast, just in front of Zabra. So it shows us that they do move along the coastline and 
can be some quite some distance and that's just punctual events so we don't know what they're doing in between but we know at least that they move from one point to another but the most impressive migration we have witnessed is this one so it's a female who was first seen in tofu beach area in january 2017 and only four months later andrea so it was the massively pregnant female i showed you earlier so that's that's the one um andrea spotted her in binoculos in the bazaruto archipelago national park and it was really heavily pregnant ready to give birth so we think that it might be there might be a cutting ground somewhere in the area but no one has ever witnessed a free swimming pup a small ice stingray baby so we don't know they might just freeze the pups uh, out of sight, maybe a little bit offshore or deeper, so we, we don't know. And then ne the next year, so in July 2018, the same ray was spotted again back in Tofu uh, waters. So that's 200 kilometers one way to the national park and 200 kilometers back to Tofu. And that's just, we didn't know about it, but that, that's just the longest migration ever recorded for array of this family of the Dastiatidae family so that was that was really exciting and that shows they do move um, quite a lot along the coastline so they could be able to maybe go shore or maybe go to South Africa or even north to Tanzania who knows so for now we just have pictures so it's very punctual but maybe one day we will have um, um, some means of tracking them like satellite tags or acoustic tags just to know more about the movements but that shows how mobile these rays are uh, in this area um, now quickly just a bit of seasonality with the data we had like just the sightings and the dive logs we were able to determine that we had a peak of sightings um, from june to september in tofu uh, so you see the bars, blue bars, are the total number of dives for each month uh, across all the years um, of the study. And the um, black line is the mean number, the average number of rays seen per dive for each month. So you see there's a peak uh, from June to September, but the peak is only at 0 0.1 ray per dive. So that means if you want to have the best chance of seeing one come to tofu come between june and september maybe july would be the best <laughs> and just hope and statistically you would see one every 10 dives 10 dives so that's still very rare and the rest of the year is just worse so we don't know where they're going so that's tofu we know the remember the female the pregnant female she was seen of tofu in january and then she was up north in Pasaruto Archipelago in May. So it's not like it's it's just statistics. That's what we observe empirically, but we don't know where they're going. If they're going north or south, it might be temperature dependence. We don't know. That's what we see. Um, and now just a little bit about predation. That's something really mysterious too, because we do see some shark bites on small ice stingrays. But when you look at major rays in the same area, they almost all have shark bites. It's really particular of this major ray population in Mozambique. They have so many scars compared to other populations in um, Asia, for example. So in small nesting rays, it's not common. I think we have maybe three or four individuals with, with scars or maybe five, six, if you count the tail. Sometimes it's a bite mark like this, so you really see it's a shark bite. And sometimes it can be the tail, that they have no tail anymore. So the probable explanation, like what shark could possibly feed on small ice stingrays in this area, our suspect number one is the bull shark, because they are very common in Bazaruto Archipelago. Um, they do feed on manta rays and such uh, stingrays, so they are probably our best suspect for that. But we also have other big shark species like tiger sharks, hammerheads, and great whites. But they are very, very rare compared to the bull sharks that are very abundant 
up north on the coast. So that's just guesses again. Um, the, the one thing though that we can think about um, when you know that the smallest stingrays are have so few scars from predation, it's either that the sting, the stinger they have is very dissuasive for predated predators, or they are likely to die from such such attacks. So it's probably probably so either either option that we, we can conclude right now. And last topic I want to tell you about is the um, mysterious relationship smaller stingrays seem to have with other another smaller stingray species. So remember in the video, I hope it worked, <laughs> you could see the smaller stingray um, so trying to feed and followed by all these smaller stingrays. So those were grays, which um, are another species of the same Desiatidae family. They are often confused with the Jenkins whip ray, um, which is a totally different species, but they look really similar. So that the range, the known range of the pink whip ray is very un uncertain because they get confused with the other species. So it's not really official that we find them in Mozambique, but it is a pink whip ray that we see very regularly with small icing rays in Mozambique. So that's two pictures taken from uh, this one is from Bazaruto Archipelago and this one from Tofu Water. So regularly we see a small icing ray swimming along with one or two pink whip rays. So with the video, you might have the explanation why they do that, because the smaller stingrays think uh, that it's going to be a big meal if uh, they keep following the bigger ray, the bigger, smaller stingray. But it might be not as simple as that. So I'm going to show you another footage from Australia. So I think it was close to the Yongala wreck, where they see small stingrays apparently on a regular basis. And yeah, I'll just comment it afterwards. So now you see it's quite the same scene as uh, in the previous video from the BBC documentary, except there's no seafloor. It's mid water, it's far from any seafloor <laughs> you could ever see. So, why are they still piggybacking on the small ice stingray and followed by cobias? Uh, so, either small ice stingray is foraging mid water, which is really uh, which would be really random, or there's another explanation to this behavior. So for the rays, this race, it, so it's from um, a paper in 2016 from Mikan. Uh, so they witnessed this behavior and they came up with two explanations. One was that it was a predator defense strategy. So kind of the pink whip rays were trying to break up silhouettes so that the sharks could not really distinguish the small eye, big small eye stingray and the other one small that are kind of together with it. Or it would be, um, it would provide kind of a hydrodynamic advantage to swim alongside um, or on top of, the, of a bigger ray. So I yeah, don't really know, but the fact is that this pink whip rays do that with other big rays than the small thing, right? They also do that with the blood stranger ray and there's pictures of the rays on top of a big blotch fence ray, but on the seafloor. So it is a very mysterious relationship, and it's actually quite uncommon to see that kind of interactions between two elasmobranch species other than predation. So another mystery we would want to find out about the, the small ice stingray. So that's pretty much it. Um, we still have so many things to do and so far we work with pictures and sightings and there are so many other tools we would like to um, use on small stingrays and that could 
be really helpful to know more about them. Uh, so I told you about the acoustic or satellite tagging that would allow us to know exactly where they're going, how deep and when. So just to kind of maybe identify the key areas where they're staying or feeding or reproducing so that we can better protect them maybe. Um, biopsies could help them understand what they eat and where they are in the food web, for example. Um, genetics, uh, that would be really helpful. Uh, the taxonomy is really, it has been recently updated, but they're not sure that the small eye stingray does belong to the family where they are now. And it could help also know if the um, population in Mozambique is, can be classified as healthy and maybe also how different it is from the small eye stingrays population in Australia. So that would be really interesting to do. And there are other tools as well, but so, so many things, so many exciting things. And hopefully it is really in MMF uh, vision to learn more uh, about these species and hopefully update their conservation status, at least in Mozambique, um, to make sure that if they need protection, they are protected um, as much as we can provide it. So thank you so much for your attention. And um, I don't know if you, I haven't checked who is in uh, the, the chat, but uh, if you don't know about Mozambique and Tofu, it's really an amazing place. And we are, so we are partners with very, very divers and they are amazing, amazing crew to dive with. So if you just have the chance to go there, really, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing place to see so many animals and just <laughs> just made a, a slide uh, to remind you position of Mozambique and Tofu and this is all pictures I've taken during my stay there so manta rays, both species, the um, reef manta, giant manta, whale sharks, humpback whales, turtles, dolphins, just marine paradise so if you have the chance yeah I really recommend it. So if you have any question I'm going to Take a look at the, um, okay, at the chat. Where is that? Okay, so stop sharing screen and chat. Yay. <laughs> okay, is there a place? Uh, I cannot hear you, Shanae, I think. How about Yay. now? Great. Classic, <laughs> start talking without unmuting myself. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I saw a really good question that was basically, let's say people have footage and videos of the small eye stingray, should they send them somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, there's um, uh, an email address if it's one that you've seen in Mozambique, uh, you can send it to us. If it's somewhere else, I don't know if there's a particular location that might be good to precise, but I putting in the chat box the um, email address that you can send um, the, um, the pictures and footage you have, and that we will include in our cat catalog and maybe find find a match, see if we already uh, if we have already seen this individual. So it helps us um, anyway. So I think that's the one. Yes. So yeah, I just I just put it here. So any researcher from the Marine Megafauna Foundation would be a good person to send you videos, but this one is trying to gather all the photos and videos. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Great. So small eye at marinemegafauna.org if anyone has pictures, videos, additional information. Yeah. Um, let's see, Dan is watching. <laughs> and he <laughs> wants to know, did you say that they lose their venom but still retain their stinger? And no. Uh, no, I, I don't really know about the venom. I don't know if it's been studied really in details for the small eye stingray. Apparently, they do have venom and in the stinger, so I don't know more about it. Uh, what do we know about venom in wheat tails? Do most retain the venom? 
that's a really good question. I think the, the, they all have venom. Most of them have venom, like actively poisonous venom. That's a really efficient way uh, to defend themselves against the, against the predators. <laughs> OK. Um, so let's say we have a smaller stingray and we want to tag them. And I've seen videos where we tag manta rays. And they don't seem too affected. They're, you know, really large animals and, you know, very rarely do they show any kind of like actual negative response. But even if they did, we know that manta rays, they don't have a stinger at all. So as far as studying stingrays and tagging them go, it seems like it might be kind of dangerous. And is there any like other studies of stingrays that should like guide you in this next step? Uh, so. I'm not aware of any tagging uh, program underwater for stingrays. Um, I know of the Florida one for eagle rays, and I have some colleagues because I'm working with them right now on an eagle ray project, and some of them had been stung by eagle rays several times, and it's so painful. I've seen pictures, it's awful, really, <laughs> it's awful. But uh, they do not do it underwater. They kind of catch the ray and then move it to a well on boats, and it happens in the manipulation or the handling that the person is just at a wrong, in the wrong place at the wrong time and it happens. But I'm not aware of any tagging program underwater. So that would be, I guess, a first. And that would be probably dangerous. I have only heard of Andrea taking mucus samples on small ice rays recently, but she's used to it. And she was like, yeah, it's totally chill and it looks fine, but I'm like, I don't want to be the one trying the tagging first. But I don't know, that would be something really to be really careful with um, for the first tagging, first attempt tagging them. Yeah. Yeah, big, uh, big underwater adventures. Of course, everyone, when you think of stingrays and stingray accents, you jump to like the famous yeah. incident. So mm -hmm. it's not. It's not without its danger, that's for sure. Yeah. Got another question from Dan um, about the swimming style. And with the rays either flapping or undulating, is it related to which depth they're regularly found at along the bottom of the blue? Um, I think it definitely has to do with their lifestyle. So. With this phrase, like the manta rays, eagle rays, small eye sting rays, we see them midwater and they are kind of pelagic or semi pelagic species. Although, um, whereas the, um, the stingrays, the regular stingrays, we only see them, almost only see them near the seafloor. Even when they're swimming, they're still really close to the bottom. So I think it definitely has to do with how much they use the marine space, I mean, the water column. And so I don't know about the depth, maybe, I don't know. I would say probably more with the lifestyle of foraging or swimming midwater than just the depth uh, in general. Because the, they, sorry, do, no. well, they do swim, they do, they are found really also deep, like the smallest thing is, I think it's up to, I mean, down to 200 meters deep. And we know mentors and eagle rays can also kind of uh, dive quite deep, so I don't know, it's most more, has to do more with the way they use the water column, I guess. Yeah, and, and we have like in Alaska, super deep water skates, and skates are much more diamond shaped mm -hmm. oh, than yeah. around stingrays as well. But I'm not sure we know a lot about like if they're big travelers or not. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really cool to see the video of the traveling midwater small eye from Australia with all mm -hmm. of the friends basically like hitching a ride. Do, yeah. Is there more footage like that or is that just kind of like a one rare thing just like the BBC? So, so I think the gathering with all the rays, it, had, it has been recorded by recreational divers too. I received one from Tofu. And I was like, seriously, I've never seen this. That's so cool. And it was really neat water. It was really not close to the bottom. So that was really cool too. I've seen some footages in Australia again, but 
closer to the, um, the sea floor. So, yeah, I guess it happens, but it's still, I don't know, it's still weird, like, if they're doing it just for the food or it, it gives them another advantage doing that because when they do it in midwater, you don't see what food they could possibly feed on. Yeah. Yeah, and those smaller stingrays that are following it, they're also not swimming in a flapping motion, still keeping their under mm -hmm. them, even though they're yeah. in the yeah. Let's see. Do you find that when you give this presentation, because I know you gave it a couple times in Tofu, are people just kind of like floored by it? I just like this new weird creature, even though I've been diving in Tofu, I've never seen a small ice stingray. Oh, no. So is it, is it um, mixed reviews or are people pretty into it? Um, I guess they're curious about it. I'm not sure they feel really reassured knowing that there are stingrays and really big stingrays with a possible really big stinger. So that might be something like that just doesn't make them excited about them. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, just curious. And because it's rare, I think it's probably just the fact that they are so rare. It's so cool to be able to see one in your lifetime. So I guess that's the main point that makes them really cool. And there are targeted ray fisheries, right? People target stingrays, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So in theory, if you were catching any kind of ray and you got this massive ray, it'd be like a pretty big paycheck to fishermen. You'd get a lot of meat out of those wings. Is there an incentive, do you think, behind targeting bigger ones? Um, I don't know. I don't really know about that. But so far, it's all just like lucky bycatch, basically. Yeah, yeah. It is really something that never seen before, and they're like, oh my god, this is so big, and we never, we've never seen this before. So yeah, yeah. And I mean, I don't know because it might be related to the um, the fishing method they use. So if it's like bottom, like the trawler and everything, they just like kind of take everything that is at the bottom. So smaller stingrays are probably less likely to be caught because they use all the water column and are semi pelagic or right but if it's long lines or other types of fishing maybe they are vulnerable as well and because they're so big and they use coastal waters that also makes them vulnerable to that kind of fishing that occurs in all their range yeah those dots that were read of the data that had been reports but fished and dead small ice stingrays are those coming direct like from the fisheries themselves or is that some kind of like governmental ID program do you know? Uh, I think I, I wouldn't know about the proportions but some of them are researchers that were on board studying maybe other species of stingrays in Asia for example and others other records are from governmental programs just recording all the species we can in that waters or yeah so it's really random yeah it's just all of the data seems like really random so far and it's a lot of like here's all this stuff we know but yeah know so much more no yeah i know it's crazy and i feel like i'm always repeating the same thing during the talk like this is something dory you know a lot about but here we go <laughs> here we go here we not and feel what we know so yeah, but it's yeah. exciting to have this huge, huge animal in the ocean that are like mm -hmm. so many question marks. We don't know anything about it. And it just, I don't know, you know, it's always fun to see that there's more to know, there's more to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're doing it. Stingray exploration, taking a break from small eyes, getting eagle ray action in. <laughs> Very useful though for other aspects, <laughs> learning lots on rays in general, so yeah. But hopefully you'll be back on smallizing or research one day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. Yay. All of us one day. Let's all go to food, do a small ice stingray dive. Awesome. Well, let's see, we've got Corey who sent a picture to Nikita. I think I got the pictures, yeah, with a couple of things with rays. Yeah, true. Sure. Um, yeah, it's in, in the records. I got it all, I think. I, it sounds familiar. So I'm, You pretty I'm much think. know all the pictures by heart by now, right? Yay. 
and the females that we've seen seven years uh, from the, the start, when the when Anna sent me the picture, I recognized it at first glance. I was like, "You saw this Monite? No way!" <laughs> <laughs> but she was like, "How come you you know them by heart? Like you, you can recognize the spots, and you just spend so much time on the." You're computer. basically a crazy cat lady, like but with small eye stingrays. Exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I think that's wrapping up our question section. Um, thank you, team, so much for taking time to give us your presentation. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me presenting. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Everybody stay safe, and maybe we'll see you on our next Fauna Friday talk. Yay. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.